Nothing elevates an action scene quite like the actors doing their own stunts. It adds a much needed sense of realism while making us a lot more invested in the protagonist's struggle because we can see their actual face and a little bit of danger helps to justify an A-lister's eight-figure salary of Hollywood blood money. But there are certain actors who are particularly famous for doing their own stunts and Tom Cruise is probably the most notable modern example being part of a franchise that's more or less about him trying really, really hard to kill himself while looking as cool as possible. But there is one actor who pioneered the stunt work that we take for granted today. An actor so dedicated to his craft that he pulled off stunts so insane that quite frankly, it's amazing that he didn't die. The evil can evil of cinema. Buster Keaton. But before we get into the mad lad, a big thank you to Displate for sponsoring this video. Displate produces high quality metal prints that are easily mounted onto the wall with the help of a magnet. All you have to do is choose from a wide range of cool designs on the website, apply the magnet onto the wall and slap that bad boy on there. Displate has all of your favourite franchises covered and I managed to get some Displates from my favourite franchises. We've got Dark Souls, we've got Death Stranding, don't worry about that one, we've got Alien. So click my link down in the description to see a collection of some of my other favourite disc plates and you can start your own collection of the things that you're a fan of, with a discount of 27% off of one or two disc plates and a discount of 37% off of three or more disc plates. And you're not just supporting my channel by clicking the link, but also the environment. Not only because you're saving paper, because disc plates are made of metal, but because you plant a tree with every disc plate that you buy. Can you guess what it is yet? That's metal. The discount of up to 37% at the link below is only available for a limited time, so make sure you get in there fast. New sponsor. Show them some love. Click the link. Joseph Frank Keaton VI was born on the 4th of October 1895 in the small town of Pika, Kansas. His parents were Joseph and Myra Keaton, who were a pair of vaudevillians who owned a travelling show called the Mohawk Indian Medicine Company, where they performed alongside Harry Houdini and sold patent medicine on the side. Although this medicine was essentially snake oil. Vaudeville is a type of variety show that was very popular back in the early 1900s and it was known for its lack of restraint and it was very often as edgy and offensive as possible and it involved a lot of slapstick comedy that was bordering on just outright violence. With all of this in mind, Joseph clearly had a pretty unorthodox start to his life, but by all accounts, he was a bouncing baby boy. Literally. Accounts differ on what exactly happened in his origin story, or even if this part is true at all, but apparently when little Joseph was around 6 or 18 months old, he fell down a full flight of stairs. But... He was completely unharmed, and in some retellings of the story, apparently young Joseph got up and laughed after it. Then, apparently, either Harry Houdini himself or a family friend who just watched young Joseph fly down a flight of stairs, apparently they turned to his parents and said, that was quite a buster your kid took. And so the nickname stuck. Buster Keaton had found 
his stage name. Now all he needed was a stage. As you would expect, running a travelling show full-time while caring for a very young child is far from an easy task. Buster's parents found it very difficult to keep an eye on him while they were performing, which led to Buster accidentally locking himself inside a suitcase and nearly suffocating. From this point onwards, Buster was left at the boarding house that he and his family were staying in while his parents performed, although this didn't turn out to be much safer. When he was almost three years old, Buster threw a brick at a peach tree and the brick bounced back and smashed him right in the face, leaving a big gash under his eye. And he was also sucked out of an upstairs window by a cyclone, but he somehow managed to land safely in the middle of the street with only minor injuries. Buster was such a danger to himself while unattended that he also lost the tip of his right index finger after getting it caught in a clothes ringer. Joseph and Myra realised that they couldn't just leave him alone while they were performing. So, they put him where they could see him. On stage with them. Buster joined their act at the age of five, and their act became known as the Three Keatons. It also led to some very interesting family photos. The act itself constantly varied, but the general premise was that Buster's dad would stand on stage, usually giving a lecture about how to properly raise a child, while Buster would stand behind him and imitate him and mock him and generally be an annoying piece of work. But that was all part of the act and part of the show, that was all part of the comedy. And then what would happen is Buster's dad would turn around and catch him, And as punishment, Buster's dad would pick up five-year-old Buster and launch him through the air (laughs) off the stage and into the crowd. (laughs) And and sometimes, sometimes the uh, the the dad would miss, and Buster would go head first into the orchestra pit. Parenting. And all of this would occur while his mother, Myra, was at the side of the stage playing the saxophone. In addition to solving the babysitting issue, adding Buster to the family business greatly increased its popularity. With their newfound success, the three Keatons gained a reputation as being, and I quote, the roughest act that ever was in the history of the stage. And Buster himself was billed as the little boy who can't be damaged. Through the vaudeville circuit, Buster learned all the tricks of the trade, including singing, dancing, playing the piano and ukulele, and most importantly, writing gags. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Throwing around a five-year-old like he's a Hermes package marked fragile sounds like a pretty cruel thing to do. Especially since they stitched a suitcase handle into the back of his clothes to make throwing him around a lot easier. But, but, Buster was almost, almost never, almost never actually hurt doing any of this. In fact, the worst injuries that he suffered during his vaudeville career came from a train wreck that left him with bruises and cuts on his face. Of course, and this this should obviously go without saying, do not throw your children through the air. But it wasn't luck that kept Buster in one piece during his performances, but skill. As Buster himself put it, The secret is in landing limp and breaking the fall with a foot or hand. It's knack. I started so young that landing right is second nature with me. Several times I'd have been killed if I hadn't been able to land like a cat. Imitators of our act don't last long because they can't stand the treatment. Buster had learned to cheese the ragdoll physics of our reality to avoid taking fall damage so well that he genuinely enjoyed being thrown around, which would often make him laugh during the act. However, he noticed that the audience 
laughed less as a result of this. Apparently, watching a child get launched through the air isn't as funny if he doesn't look hurt afterwards. What a lovely crowd. So Buster had to put on his game face. He learned to remain completely expressionless during his performances and he developed his iconic deadpan look, which would later lead to him being referred to as the Great Stone Face. Despite how much Buster enjoyed his new showbiz career, yeeting a small child through the air and off the stage looks pretty dodgy, and people very often got concerned, so it was only a matter of time before the law got involved, and to avoid getting arrested for child abuse, whenever Buster's dad was approached by the cops, he would tell them, don't worry boys, this isn't a child, it's actually a dwarf. <laughs> and, and as insane, and as insane as that lie sounds, it actually worked and the cops believed him. However, this lie didn't always work and Buster's parents were very often arrested for alleged child abuse. Unfortunately, the it's just a prank bro argument didn't really convince anyone, so Buster had to prove their innocence to the chief of police by showing up at the chief's office and lifting his shirt and removing his trousers to show the police chief that he didn't have any bruises or broken bones. Buster had no formal education and was forced to go to a public school in New York. However, he got kicked out only halfway through his first day for being disruptive because he would use the classroom as a stage to practice his act. Nevertheless, despite being rigorously educated at the School of Hard Knocks, Buster still learned reading and arithmetic. In fact, he was so good at arithmetic that he was in charge of managing the family's finances at the age of 13 and the books were said to contain some very impressive penmanship for a kid his age. In fact, Buster's parents thought that he was so responsible that he was even driving a car at the age of 12. After 16 years of success, the three Keatons finally disbanded in January of 1917 due to the father, Joe, developing a severe drinking problem that got very out of control. This affected his timing during the act, which made the act very dangerous for the 21-year-old Buster, as well as giving Joe a very volatile temperament off stage, which prompted Buster and Myra to call it a day and move to New York without Joe. From here, Buster managed to use his considerable clout to get a Broadway gig, signing on to appear in Schubert's passing show with a weekly salary of $250. However, this cushy theatre job was never meant to be. Buster broke the contract after less than two months after a chance meeting with fellow actor Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who took a liking to Buster and offered him a role in his silent film, The Butcher's Boy. Despite initially being sceptical about film, which he and his father saw as just a fad, Buster took the role on anyway and shot his scenes in one go on the same day. Buster was so fascinated by the camera that he wanted to learn as much as he could about it, so he asked if he could take the camera home with him. He then dismantled the camera and put it back together to figure out how it worked. Buster became so enamoured with the camera and its potential that he quit his theatre job and signed on to work with Roscoe for $40 a week. Buster's roots in vaudeville meant that he was very well suited for silent movies because of his aptitude for physical comedy and communicating solely through body language, which quickly got him promoted. After making only three movies with Fatty Arbuckle, Buster became his assistant director and one-man gag department. Not co-writer, not assistant writer, the entire department. Buster basically churned out gag after gag like a machine, with an efficiency and consistency that became the envy of entire Hollywood writers' rooms. 
A raise also came with this recognition and Buster's salary increased to almost as much as he would have earned on the stage. So the risk had paid off and Buster was doing what he loved thanks to the help of Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, who had become a mentor and very close friend to Buster. Unfortunately, Buster's career was put on hold when he was drafted into the army and sent to France during World War I. But as much as we love mad lads with crazy war stories, Buster's time in the trenches wasn't particularly eventful, as he only served on the back lines as a cryptographer and, naturally, an entertainer with the only injuries he suffered being permanent hearing damage from an ear infection. Luckily, it wasn't too long before Buster was back home and picking up right where he left off, making extremely successful short films that quickly made him into a household name. In 1920, Buster played the lead role in a feature film for the first time in The Saphead, and it was around about this time that he got noticed by Roscoe's boss, Joseph Schenk, who offered Buster a ticket to the big leagues. Buster was given his own production unit, which meant that he was finally in full control and allowed to make whatever he wanted. Through Buster Keaton Productions, Buster got to work and made 19 short films over the next three years, the most famous of which was 1922's Cops, where Buster grabs onto a speeding car. Despite the fact that they were no longer working together, Fatty Arbuckle and Buster Keaton remained very good friends and stuck together through thick and thin. Even when Fatty got me too'd and was charged with the manslaughter of Virginia Rapp after she fell fatally ill at a party that he had hosted, he was also accused of other, let's just say, pretty heinous acts. But it turns out, after investigations, it's most likely that all of these accusations were obviously false, but the public and press were out for blood. Three trials took place due to the first two ending in hung juries, with studio executives ordering all of Roscoe's fellow actors and industry friends to not defend him, threatening harsh consequences for anyone that didn't toe the line. Nevertheless, Buster risked his career to stand by his friend, publicly proclaiming his innocence. But, luckily, this only earned Buster a slap on the wrist and didn't stop him from testifying in Fatty's defence during the third trial. Thankfully, Fatty was eventually acquitted, but his career never recovered. The sensationalised and libelous reporting of the scandal destroyed his reputation beyond repair. But fortunately, there was one man in Hollywood that refused to turn his back on Fatty. Buster was such a bro that he gave him 35% of the profits from his production company to keep him afloat after his legal defence left him broke. Buster's mentor's time in the light had come to an end, but it wouldn't take long for the student to become the master and the next few years would ensure that the stone-faced man in the pork pie hat would go on to become an immortal symbol of American cinema. Speaking of Buster's iconic hat, Buster made these hats by cutting down Stetsons and stiffening the brims with sugar water, but because of how Buster made movies, these hats never really lasted long. While Buster chose the pork pie hat because straw hats were far too fragile for his kind of act, they were still very often lost or destroyed. In fact, Buster's hats became so iconic that people would just snatch them off his head and run away with them. Probably so they could show off to their friends that they had Buster Keaton's hat or so they could sell them off to Hollywood collectors. So Buster had to have spare hats with him everywhere he went. And each of these hats cost $3.50 and Buster went through thousands of these hats throughout his career. After three years of making short films, Buster's first shot at directing a full-length feature film 
was 1923's Three Ages, which was a romantic comedy set across three different eras of history. Despite the popularity of his short films, there was a sort of insurance policy put into place just in case Buster's two real success didn't scale up to seven reels. The movie was deliberately structured in three distinct parts so that if the film didn't do well financially, they could split it up and release it as three shots instead. Thankfully, this contingency plan turned out to be unnecessary because Buster took full advantage of this opportunity to show off not only his aptitude for bigger projects, but also his flexibility as a filmmaker. Buster was actually supposed to make that jump, but despite the stunt going wrong, Buster saw the opportunity for a gag and extended the sequence into the one that we all know and love. After a few days of recovery from falling quite a distance into the safety net. This knack for improv was actually a core part of Buster's creative process as he didn't really like writing full scripts. Sure, he would have a beginning and an end and figure out the general story that he wanted to tell, but Buster liked to make up the middle as he went along, shooting pretty much whatever he felt like on the day. In Three Ages, Buster also gave a glimpse into the kinds of risky stunts that would go on to define him, as he drove a car that collapsed with him inside it. After filming Three Ages, Buster started filming Our Hospitality, which almost killed him. While filming a scene in a rushing river, Buster was attached to a safety line to stop him from being swept away and drowning. At least that was the plan. (laughs) Unfortunately, the line snapped and Buster was sent down the river rapids, suffering bruises and scrapes as he bashed against rocks before managing to grab onto a hanging tree branch and pull himself out. But while he was doing that, he found himself completely surrounded by a school of water snakes. Though, luckily, they didn't do him any more damage than he'd already done to himself. After this incident, the following waterfall scene was filmed in a studio out of safety concerns, using a man-made waterfall that was built over a swimming pool. In this scene, Buster was suspended by a rope and jumped into the waterfall to save his damsel in distress, from falling into the depths below. The setup for this stunt sounds much safer than filming in actual river rapids, doesn't it? I mean, After such a dangerous near miss, it's good to know that precautions were taken to make this stunt as safe as possible, at least by Buster's standards. I mean, sure he would still need his trademark strength and acrobatic ability to pull it off, but this was a controlled environment. Surely nothing could go wrong. Buster got overwhelmed by the rush from the fake waterfall and he got knocked around quite a lot and he actually ended up taking in a dangerous amount of water. Buster had ingested so much water that he actually needed medical attention. The doctor had to drain his ears, his nostrils, and his stomach. Near-death experiences aside, the movie was also notable for starring Buster's wife, Natalie Talmadge, who he had married in 1920. And no, she wasn't sent down the waterfall with Buster, She was pregnant at the time, and sensible, so a mannequin was used in her place. But, sadly, the couple were not as happy as you would think. Natalie was a bit of a... 
financial black hole who blew a third of Buster's salary on clothes and also demanded that they move into increasingly lavish houses, which culminated in Buster spending $300,000 to have a mansion built in Beverly Hills called the Italian Villa. Despite the extent that Buster went to to accommodate Natalie's desires, the seven-year itch ended up coming a few years early for Buster. In 1924, after having two kids, Natalie decided that Buster's marital duties were complete and that the couple no longer needed to sleep in the same bed. And as if being relegated to his own bedroom wasn't enough, she informed Buster that he could have affairs if he wanted, as long as he kept quiet about it. I know that it was the 1920s and that divorce wasn't exactly socially acceptable at the time, but surely separating is better than that. Imagine being that much of a gold digger that you willingly cuck yourself. Obviously, Buster had to make a lot of money to fund this lifestyle and keep up the facade of a happy marriage, so he had to keep doing what he did best. His next notable movie was Sherlock Jr., in which he played a broke projectionist who competes for the affection of his crush while dreaming about being a detective. Despite the simple premise, Buster really ups the ante with his stunt work, going as far as running on top of a moving train. I think it's obvious how dangerous doing something like this is, but Buster literally put his neck on the line to get off the train. Buster grabbed the spout of the water tower in the background, which released a stream of water that pushed him to the ground. Unfortunately, the blast from the water was a lot harder than Buster expected and he hit his neck on one of the train rails which resulted in Buster suffering from terrible headaches for several days after the stunt and the full extent of the damage wouldn't be revealed until nine years later when he went for a routine checkup where the doctor looked at some x-rays and just casually asked Buster so when did you break your neck? Buster Keaton had broken his neck and didn't even realise until almost a decade later. Considering how severe that injury could have been with an extremely high possibility of paralysis and death, it's clear that Buster is an extremely lucky man. During one scene later in the movie, Buster had to get off the roof of a second story building. So... How do you think he accomplished that? Did he climb down a conveniently placed ladder or did he slide down an awning to a height that was safe to lower himself down from or did he grab onto a roadblock gate and ride it down into a moving car that whisked him away? Of course it was the gate. Why would Buster do something sensible when he can do something dangerous but funny? To give credit where it's due, this is still significantly less dangerous than Buster's previous aquatic antics, but it still required great strength and balance to hold on to the gate and also perfect timing to make sure that he got into the car safely. As I'd imagine would have been a massive relief to the producers and the studio's insurance company, it wasn't all death-defying antics. Buster also demonstrated his mastery of movie magic in Sherlock Jr. For example, take this motorcycle chase scene where Buster avoids colliding with a train by the skin of his teeth. That wasn't actually done for real. 
it was done on camera because CGI didn't exist yet, but Buster had an idea that was revolutionary at the time. He faked it by shooting the scene in reverse. Buster and the train were both moving backwards and they did the old switcheroo with the film in the editing room to make it look like they were moving towards each other. Earlier in the same scene, Buster appears to jump straight through a man in a dress that was holding a suitcase to escape from some goons when backed up against a fence. Now, I know what you're thinking, there are plenty of fancy editing tricks that could have made this possible by switching props and actors between takes, but that would have been too easy. This was all done in one shot, and Buster didn't have any TARDIS technology lying around to make the suitcase bigger on the inside. So how did he do it? Well, it was all an illusion. The fence had a section sawn out that acted as a trap door and the man with the suitcase was strapped to it so that his body was parallel to the ground. The dress and the suitcase were hollowed out and hung from the actor's shoulders so that Buster could actually get through them. Once Buster had jumped, the trap door was closed and the suitcase man landed inside the dress and the straps were cut from the other side, allowing him to walk away. It's pretty genius and unusually for Buster, pretty safe. Well, almost safe because he did end up landing face first in the dirt. In 1926, Buster was inspired by a story from the Civil War and set out to make his masterpiece, The General. Buster received a total budget of $400,000 to tell the story of a Confederate train engineer who pursues a band of Union spies who kidnapped the two loves of his life his girlfriend, and more importantly, his train. Buster, his family, and his crew moved to Cottage Grove in Oregon and got to work. But this wasn't just another slapstick comedy movie. Buster knew that he had to pull out all of the stops and make this a truly sweeping epic with as much drama as there was comedy. Despite not being in Hollywood, This was one hell of a production. Buster had an entire fake town built just for shooting and he bought 18 whole freight cars full of Civil War props. These ranged from things like cannons and stagecoaches and he bought over 1,200 costumes for all of the extras. The locals were really excited to have Hollywood come to their town and they were really eager to play as extras in the movie. Also, 500 members of the Oregon National Guard were recruited to play as the Union and Confederate armies. With the location picked, the cast selected and everything, including two full, genuine locomotives in place, shooting went full steam ahead. The town had a set of parallel tracks, which were perfect for filming the chase scenes, However, they weren't very long, so Buster had to stitch together dozens of brief shots of the train running across the same track over and over again, using clever camera angles and background changes to disguise the fact that the train was constantly in the same place. However, this was a very tedious and time-consuming process, with each shot taking two hours to set up. The first notable stunt occurred relatively early in the movie, with a dejected buster sitting on the crankshaft of a moving train. That looks easy, doesn't it? And yeah, it was easy if we don't count the fact that if the train suffered wheel spin, Buster would have been killed instantly. The man couldn't even sit still safely. However, the movie's most dangerous stunt occurred in a scene where Buster is driving a train. The Union thieves had left a rail tie lodged on the track, which could have derailed the whole train if they collided, so Buster ran onto the track to dislodge it, 
risking getting hit by his own train in the process. He managed to grab the rail tie without a hitch, but backed up onto the train's cow catcher while holding the heavy tie. But he wasn't out of the woods just yet. The train was quickly approaching another rail tie that the thieves had laid across the track. Buster had to dislodge it, but he couldn't move to stop the train. He didn't have enough time and his hands were full, so he killed two birds with one stone and at the last second threw the rail tie onto the other rail tie to dislodge it. Look at Buster's face as that second tie bounces out the way. Imagine the relief that he must have been feeling because that stunt went well. There were, there were so many ways that Buster could have died there. The, the main one being that he could have lost his balance and get ran over by a fucking train. But Buster was not the only one that was at risk of injury while making the general. And the shoot was pretty grueling. A train actually ran over a brakeman's foot, which earned him almost $3,000 in a lawsuit. A casting director was also shot by a blank cartridge, and Buster himself was knocked out cold when he stood too close to a firing cannon. During the battle scenes, several men were caught up in explosions, fell from horses, and also almost drowned in a river that was much deeper than the crew expected. Naturally, all of these setbacks caused the film to fall very far behind schedule and also go massively over budget. Joseph Schneck was very mad when he found out that the $400,000 budget had almost doubled to $750,000. So he put a lot of pressure on Buster to hurry up and finish the movie. And... Smokey the Bear would also have been very unhappy as the crew had to regularly deal with forest fires caused by the very hot and dry summer. Eventually, Buster was almost finished and just had to shoot his big climactic set piece. From the footage that I've shown you so far, it's very clear that Buster made his movies with similar levels of imagination to that of a child smashing his toys together. And Buster would be damned if he didn't get to smash the biggest one of them all. To cap off his movie, Buster was going to attempt the most expensive shot in silent film history. A local holiday was declared so that over 3,000 people could witness the big moment. A burning bridge collapsing with the Union train halfway across it. A 215 feet long bridge was built and the river below it was dammed. Buster set up six cameras to capture the carnage. Trial runs were made, supporting beams were partially sawn through and dynamite was attached to make the collapse easier. Buster only had one shot at this, so he absolutely had to get it right. This is a very long video. Day two. Finally, Four hours behind schedule, he was ready. The bridge was lit, the camera rolled, the train chugged along the track. It was showtime. He did it. The man had actually managed to pull it off. Buster had nailed the biggest shot of his career and was absolutely thrilled. And he spent the rest of the day taking pictures with the locals amongst the wreckage. The train was actually just left in the river because 
because it was far too big to move and it became a minor tourist attraction until it was salvaged for scrap metal during World War II. And uh, by the way, Buster actually wanted to drive the train over the bridge as it fell and bail out at the last minute. But his wife wouldn't let him do it, probably because Buster's salary was uh, much higher than the life insurance payout. Instead, a dummy was put in Buster's place, which scared an onlooking woman so much that she fainted because she thought that it was a real person. The General was Buster's favourite of all the movies that he had made. So he was absolutely heartbroken when the reviews came in. Despite the literal blood, sweat and tears that went into making it, audiences didn't appreciate Buster's genius. They had expected the usual kind of light comedy that they were used to, and they were disappointed by the relative lack of laughs. Even though Buster was very dedicated to historical accuracy and approaching the subject matter respectfully, other critics thought that making an action comedy about the Civil War, which had occurred only 60 years before, was in poor taste. And to make matters even worse, the movie crashed at the box office even harder than the train and the bridge scene. The General grossed only half of its budget, making it a bomb that Buster paid for with his creative freedom. After the poor performance of The General broke Buster's lifelong streak of success, Joseph Schenck kept Buster on a tight leash for his next movie, Steamboat Bill Jr., making sure that he didn't go too crazy and kept within budget. And it was here that Buster pulled off his most famous stunt, which was probably one of his most difficult. Standing completely still. Of course, this was standing completely still while a two-ton building facade dropped around him, with only a small upstairs window ensuring that it didn't crush him, and only a nail in the ground showing him where he had to stand so he wouldn't die. Despite pulling off a stunt that The Guardian called, and I quote, as beautiful as it was potentially lethal, without a scratch on him, Buster was still seemingly incapable of making a movie without hurting himself. Buster made it through the shoots completely unscathed, however, in his free time between shoots, he liked to play baseball with the rest of his co-stars. And a stray baseball smashed him in the face <laughs> and broke his nose. So, that delayed filming for a while, so he could recover. While Steamboat Bill Jr. was more financially successful than The General, it still didn't turn much of a profit. The original ending for the movie involved a big flood, for which Buster had spent a fortune on sets. However, costs ballooned even more when all of these sets had to be scrapped. Joseph Schenck thought that the scene would be in bad taste due to the Mississippi River flood that had occurred in 1927, and so he forced Buster to spend $25,000 to replace the flood with a cyclone. Although this was probably for the best given Buster's track record with stunts involving water. Sadly, it's at this point where things went from bad to worse for Buster's career. In 1928, he made the worst decision of his life by letting Joseph Schenck sell his contract to Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, MGM Pictures, despite being warned against the move by fellow silent film stars Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd. To be fair to Buster, MGM was an extremely successful studio at the time and could have provided him with plenty of resources to keep making movies the way that he wanted. But the problem was the powers that be treated their studio's films as business ventures instead of artistic ones, which meant that Buster's wings got clipped very quickly. The Cameraman was released the same year and went on to be the last movie that Buster made in his own classic style, 
while it was both critically and commercially successful, it was an absolute nightmare behind the scenes because Buster was constantly fighting with producers for control of his own movie. Buster wasn't even the official director. The movie was directed by Edward Sedgwick, but he was sensible enough to let Buster do his own thing and essentially co-direct the film. The following year saw Buster dragged deeper and deeper into depression as the studio executives undermined him at every turn. They thought that they knew better than Buster and they snuffed out the very spark that made him successful, going as far as to make Buster Keaton use stunt doubles. Stunt doubles. They made Buster Keaton use stunt doubles. They even forced him to keep making silent movies once the sound era rolled around. And when he was allowed to make movies with sound, he had to shoot each scene three times in three different languages, memorising the words phonetically. Buster hated this because not only was he filming a film that he didn't want to make, he was just contractually obliged to do so, but he had to shoot each crappy scene three times. Things were going so badly for Buster that just like his dad, he turned to alcohol. While Buster's career crumbled, his personal life also suffered drastically. In 1932, his wife divorced him over his emerging drinking problem and because he was carousing with other women. Oh, now that his career's on the rocks and the money's not as good anymore, now, now it's a problem. Natalie then took the kids, the house, and most of Buster's money. And to add insult to injury, the kids changed their surnames from Keaton to Talmadge. And as if that wasn't even bad enough, Buster had to file for bankruptcy and pay the IRS $28,000 in back taxes because you can always count on the tax man to kick a man when he's down. In 1933, Buster's best friend, Fatty Arbuckle, died of a heart attack. <laughs> because of course he did. And Buster was fired from MGM for his alcoholism and generally being extremely difficult to work with. Despite the firing, Buster managed to maintain a steady workload, although the movies weren't that great. Buster appeared in some movies in Europe, but unfortunately, he was a couple of decades too early for the trend of American actors crossing the Atlantic to star in spaghetti westerns. Although Buster was uh, so dedicated to doing everything for real, he probably would have gotten himself shot if he starred in a spaghetti western. In addition to making cannelloni capers over in Europe, Buster also maintained a steady workload back home in the States, making short films for educational pictures and working as a gag writer for MGM, but most of his gags were recycled from Buster's earlier films and vaudeville career. Between all of these odd jobs, Buster still struggled with his drinking problem. At one point, he was caught drunkenly performing a comedy routine around a campfire for some homeless people and he would always black out after only two or three drinks. Buster's drinking ultimately got so bad that he was institutionalised in 1934. But luckily, Buster was good friends with the most famous magician who ever lived and he managed to use tricks taught to him by Houdini to get out of the straitjacket and escape the asylum. In a Joker-esque fashion, Buster even illegally married his nurse from the loony bin, a woman named Mae Scriven, and he did it during a drunken bender before his first divorce was even complete. And he didn't remember any of it. Obviously, this marriage didn't last very long, and Mae divorced Buster in 1936, taking most of his money with her. Eventually, enough was enough. Buster realised that he was going in the same direction as his dad, so he decided to get his act together. With the support of his family and doctor, Buster sobered up through sheer force of will in 1937. Buster also found massive support from Eleanor Norris, who he married on the 29th of May 1940, and he was happily married to her for the rest of his life. 
Third time's the charm. From this point, Buster's found success back where it all started. The stage. While Hollywood was an absolute hellscape that drained him for all he was worth, Buster found performing for a real audience again to be reinvigorating, and the crowd loved him too. Even though he was only making 10% of his old salary, Buster was happy again, and very generous with his money, financially supporting his parents, his siblings, and his brother's wife and child. Buster's time on stage caused a resurgence in his career, leading to a series of TV appearances throughout the 50s, including an episode of The Twilight Zone. The public rediscovered the magic of Buster Keaton, and he found himself invited to film festivals and receiving an Academy Honorary Award in 1954. By the late 1950s, Buster was even earning almost as much as he did 30 years prior. In 1965, Buster starred in The Railroader, which was a silent travelogue of Canada made by the National Film Board of Canada. Despite this essentially being an advert for Leaf America, it's a very wholesome short that harkened back to the era where Buster was at the top of his game, but without the crazy stunts. I can't exactly say that he looked happy to be there for obvious reasons, you know, got, got to stay on brand, but it's nice to see that Buster was in his element once again. But even though Buster had aged a lot by the time he re-emerged in the public eye, it's good to see that his mind for gags was just as sharp as ever. Sadly, The Railroader was one of the last films of Buster's career, as he passed away from lung cancer on the 1st of February 1966, at the age of 70. I cannot understate how massive Buster's influence is on movies to this day, having inspired many filmmakers and comedians from Mel Brooks to Johnny Knoxville. Nowadays, Buster is considered one of the greats of the silent film era, alongside Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd, and for good reason. Buster is best remembered not only for the amount of danger that he would put himself in to make us laugh, but also for his dedication to his craft and realising the potential of film as a visual medium. Buster never liked to use title cards, which was the text that would pop up on screen to provide plot details and dialogue in silent movies. Wherever possible, Buster would tell the story visually with a gag, which made the movies funnier and better paced. As Buster put it himself, the average picture used 240 titles, and the most I ever used was 56. As Buster gained the recognition he deserved, his masterpiece also found redemption. The General received a standing ovation at the 1965 Venice Film Festival and was added to the National Film Registry in 1989. Orson Welles said that The General is, and I quote, perhaps the greatest film ever made. And he even went as far as to call Buster the greatest of all the clowns in the history of cinema. And that's pretty high praise coming from the man that made Citizen Kane. Despite the hardships of the 1930s, Buster managed to live a happy and fulfilling life. As Buster put it himself, because of the way I looked on stage and screen, the public naturally assumed I felt hopeless and unloved in my personal life. Nothing could be further from the fact. As long as I can remember, I have considered myself a fabulously lucky man. It just goes to show that the bad in life doesn't negate the good, and that no matter how much life gets you down, things can always get better if you pursue what you love. So, if you ever get tired of Hollywood's constant cynical cash grabs, try out one of Buster's classics. But just remember, don't try this at home. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody says subscribe!